One thing that you should know about is we are beginning the New Testament starting Wednesday night. Yeah, pretty exciting. We had a blast on Wednesday night. We finished up the Old Testament and had a little uh, impromptu barbecue. We used to do that all the time at 8th Creek. We used to just say, hey, let's do a barbecue. And it was easy when we had 150 people. Um, but on Wednesday night, there were more than 2,300 people uh, that came and we ate some food afterwards. And it was really a packed house and it was really fun. Um, but that's just a Wednesday night Bible study, I tell you what. Uh, and uh, we should do that every week, in my opinion. Uh, the staff might say something about that, but uh, they did a wonderful job and all the volunteers, it was great. Um, but uh, one of the things, if, if you've ever been tempted, man, I really should commit you know, to a, you know, going through the Bible with AC Creek, whether you're online or here in the building, uh, this is a great time to kind of make that commitment as we start the New Testament. Man, you could uh, you know, start in Matthew and go right on through the Bible. It'll only take you 14, 15 years to get through the Bible. <laughs> Uh, with us, but, but um, one thing that I, I really do value is there's so many people that come up, Pastor Brad, I, we started in Isaiah and you know, we just did a lap through the Bible. And like, um, there's really something that's truly life-changing about uh, you know, covering some ground in the scripture and starting to sort of get what the books are all about and why they were written and how it applies to our lives. And there's something about seeing all of that in context of through the Bible. It's just really rich and it's really, really blessed. So this is a great time to jump in uh, on Wednesday night, you can join us uh, live or online. We'd love to have you uh, starting this Wednesday night. Um, normally, we take our uh, you know uh, Sunday morning teaching from our upcoming Wednesday night. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save you know our beginning for our, our through the Bible on um, the New Testament uh, on Wednesday. And as it is Fourth of July weekend, I would like to do a little Independence Day Fourth uh, of July uh, sermon uh, that I think is important and something for us to think about and, and uh, what have you. So why don't you grab your Bible, turn with me to the Psalms, Psalm 33. Psalm 33. And we'll start there in verse 12. Psalm 33, 12, it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the chosen people, pardon me, the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven and beholdeth all the sons of men. <clears throat> from the place of his habitation, he looks upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike and considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of, an, of host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. <clears throat> a horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Here the psalmist writes, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. What a true statement that is. And primarily, I think the psalmist is referring to and mindful of the Jewish nation, that's the, the, you know, God's inheritance, God's people. And that's what it's referring to. But it does, you know, you can hear the psalmist, his gaze goes beyond the Jews when he talks about how the Lord, he looks upon all the sons of men on the earth. Um, he says that in verse 14, uh, from the place of his habitation, that's, you know, um, where the Lord dwells, uh, he looks upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He sees everything. And, and then he, he reminds that, that, you know, we think that kings have power because of their host of their army. But the Lord says here in verse 16, there's no king saved by the multitude of a host. In other words, the Lord is the one who's ultimately in control. He raises kings up and leaders up and puts them down. And he's the one who controls nations. And, and it's for that reason, blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. And, and then that last verse let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. And I would say that as an American on the 4th of July weekend, oh Lord, let your mercy be upon us as Americans according as we put our hope in Trump, Biden, Hillary, Oprah. 
Who do we put our trust in? Well, you know, the, the true person that's gonna find real hope is gonna not be in, in a king or ruler or president or politician, but truly our hope is in, as it says here, let, us, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. That's where our hope should lie as Americans. And that's where our successes have been from. I think every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord above. And we've been gifted as a nation. And like the old hymn goes, God shed his grace on us. We, that's a true statement. Um, but it's an interesting thing to watch uh, just as somewhat of a person who loves to, to read history and, and see where our nation has been. Man, we have some really interesting beginnings. And I'm so thankful for the beginnings of our country. You know, um, there's a lot of things that are being retaught in a sort of reinvention of history. And a lot of you are young enough. If you're a millennial or younger, uh, you were largely taught a bunch of hogwash. I'm just gonna tell you that. Uh, and and I, I'll tell you, they've left out huge chunks of what really happened in history. Um, if you were raised as a millennial or lower, you were probably told, well, there were just a bunch of people who killed a bunch of Indians and, and the, you know, colonialists, and they were going and invading people's lands, and they were horrible, and America's never been great, and they've never done anything good. We've only just been oppressor, slave-owning, uh, horrible people, and we should pay reparations. And like that's kind of the way it goes down today in, in your classes and in schools and what have you. Uh, I'm not gonna try to say that the people and the founders weren't sinful. They were just like us. They were all sinful people. Every person on the planet that's ever lived has been sinful. And I would argue also that every nation in the world has taken their country from someone else. Just like, I mean, everybody. The only people that really didn't do that is Israel. You know, it's kind of funny. The Jews are the people that I've talked about this in previous studies, you know, about the Jews paid for their land. They were given their land by the world after World War II and the Holocaust. Uh, you know, the League of Nations or the United Nations actually gave it to the Jews. And, and not only did they buy it, not only did the world say, okay, you can have this land, but then God said, this is your land. Like what country can say that? Only Israel, not the Americans. And, and if, if people are saying, Jews, you gotta give that land back to the Arabs, then, then we should also be saying, you gotta give your, your property back to the Indians, all of us. Um, because that's the kind of MO. But there's this whole narrative that they've kind of put up, but they've left out sort of the, the good parts. What, what are some of the really good parts? And by the way, um, I don't even believe all the bad parts that they say, they're not even all true or they're, they're exaggerated. Um, you know, um, I, I would love to see the United States get back to its original sort of intention. And you know what, we pulled it off. The, this, they call it the grand experiment, you know? And it seems like we pulled it off for the first couple hundred years. It's in the last 50 years or so, the United States, we've started to spiral out of control and we're finding ourselves sort of like all the other nations now. How did that happen? And what happened to the United States? And, and is, is there any hope for this nation? Well, I believe this last verse we read, if there is any hope, it's not in a president, it's in the Lord himself. And we need to remember that. You know, it's amazing these men, the signers of the Declaration of Independence risked their lives and fortunes and, and families. I mean, it was, it was something they didn't, you don't take lightly. Um, you know, I've even heard Christians talk about, well, you know, those, if you're really a biblical scholar, you, you would know that the Revolutionary War was, was not even obeying the Bible. Um, and there's people that will make the argument, should we have even fought that? Because, you know, taxation without representation, don't tread on me. And, and it sort of comes out, if, you, if you've been taught in sort of modern ways, that, it, that those were the only issues that were going on in the American Revolution. So it was a very selfish, greedy thing that we, we rebelled against King George. It's not, I would recommend, I almost did this, but it would take us too long, but I almost wanted to go through the Declaration of Independence. To, have you read it lately? These guys took this extremely serious. They didn't, this was not a light thing. And they even acknowledged that normally you don't rebel against the authorities that are over you. And that's, that's the correct. Like they even argue, here's why. And, and it was very careful, prayerful. Um, and and they, they made this declaration that was pretty profound. Um, I would recommend reading it. It doesn't take long to read, um, but... But probably the most famous line, since I'm not gonna go over the whole thing, one of the fam most famous lines is, is this line that you know, talks about this. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Um, you know, uh, what, a, what an interesting statement to make. And this is, this is you know, in contrast, this, this, this paragraph or sentence, in contrast to what was actually happening at the time. King George in charge, the King of England, um, he was sort of the head of the church too, if you didn't know that. And you kind of had to do what King George said. Plus there was no representation for the new, you know, the new colonies. Um, so they were being very oppressed, not just taxes, but there, there, was, there was all kinds of evil and crime going on against the people in the new, you know, the, the new land, you know, the new country. And so um, after this long season of oppression, the, the people in America decided to separate and become their own nation. And they did it with great uh, fear and trepidation and care and prayer. It's really quite a story. But, um, but, but when this happened, you know, we, got, we ended up you know, getting the Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the amendments. All of these things came about as people that wanted to do, a, do it in a more righteous and better way than what they had experienced with England and the king. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I, I'm so thankful for, and we've actually at Athey Creek enjoyed having to declare this, this part of our constitution uh, as something that was being infringed upon here at Athey Creek, and that is the First Amendment. Back when we were being told by, you know, the governor, you know, you're, this church, you guys need to stop doing meeting and stop this and that. And our attorney wrote a nice letter, uh, Jenna Ellis, wrote a letter um, to, the, to the state and said, um, you know, don't forget a little thing called the constitution. And we reminded Kate Brown of this, the First Amendment. Uh, and it says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This is a very clear, uh, uh, you can't even argue this, like this is a very clear statement. So, so with this clear First Amendment, uh, you know, basically the church should be able to do what we want to do in worshiping God. Um, but then there was, there was a little thing that came that really ruined the whole thing, if you ask me. What's the, is there a single culprit that started to turn the nation in the wrong direction? I think there is. It was, it was a little phrase, separation of church and state. Where did that come from? Is it in the Constitution? Bill of Rights? Is, is it in the, you know, wh wh where, do we, where do we come with this phrase? Well, it's actually nowhere to be found. It's just kind of a made up thing that people say, act like it's some law that was signed into, into, uh, into you know, action, but it never really was. The, the, um, the se separation of church and state uh, actually has been misconstrued as something that is really um, you know, important and we need to uphold the separation of church and state. There's a story of a professor who wanted to illustrate the dangers of alcohol. So he, in front of the class, he you know, had some alcohol in a, in a glass jar and he, took an, a regular earthworm and he dropped it in the alcohol. And the kids watched as the worm kind of squirmed around for a few minutes. But um, after, it was, I think it was Jack Daniels that he put the worm in. Um, and in short order, the, the worm eventually just dissolved in minutes to just nothing. You, it just became nothing. There was no worm in there anymore. And the professor asked the class, what can we learn from this lesson? And one of the dudes in the class raises his hand, if you drink alcohol, you won't have any worms. <laughs> Sometimes people come to the wrong conclusions. <laughs> and that was the wrong conclusion. It was totally wrong in this idea of separation in church and state. The question becomes, what was the original intent of the, of the framers of the Constitution and of the First Amendment? Um, and where did the separation of church and state come from? What, you know, what did Thomas Jefferson mean? See, he's the one who wrote that sentence or that phrase, separation of church and state. And what was happening is after the First Amendment was you know, you know, signed in, um, <clears throat> there was a church that was concerned about you know, the state trying to influence the church or even affect the church or even choose a certain denomination. You know, they were worried about the, the state trying to call it. Why would they be sensitive to that? Because that's what England was doing. That's what they came out of. And we wanted freedom and liberty, especially for, for, for religion, to be a, a something we could do freely. And so the Danbury Baptist Church asked Thomas Jefferson, what are you gonna do about this? And is this, is this gonna you know, be the, the, the country basically ruling our, our churches? So Thomas Jefferson wrote a reassuring letter 
to make sure the church knew, no, man, you guys are gonna be good. And here's, let me, let me just uh, share with you part of that letter that he wrote. He, and this is just a letter, it's in history. It's in the you know, National Archive. Um, he says, I contemplate with sovereign reverence um, that, that act of the whole, whole American people which declared that their legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. That's where the phrase came from. That's where it exists. It never went into any formal documents. It's just a letter from Thomas Jefferson to a little church. And if you know the context of the letter, you know exactly what he meant. Um, the church was worried that the state would try to stop them from doing what they needed to do as, as Christian Bible-believing people. And he was reassuring them that, hey, there's a wall of separation. But if you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, give sort of commentary on this. And, and you know, there's a bunch of people that would totally disagree with me on this. Um, I'll call them all crazy, but be that as it may, um, it's a one-way wall. Um, Thomas Jefferson meant for it to be, hey, the, the government should, shall not infringe. It's a wall of protection for the church. It was never meant to be uh, a wall of protection from the church. That's what happened is, is the enemies of God, the atheists, uh, the secular humanists over the last you know, several hundred years have slowly been trying to chip away and make this separation of church and state that Thomas Jefferson meant. Um, uh, he, they, they, they wanted to make it look like it was protection from religion, not, not for religion. That, that's the way it is. And there's old groups, you know, freedom from religion. There's a, a whole groups hugely financed by atheists and stuff to try to make it sound like separation of church and state is a real thing. Um, it, so there it is, the famous words that changed our approach to religion in America forever, the separation of church and state. So it became this kind of crazy notion. Um, do you think... What do you think Thomas Jefferson would think if he saw what happened today? He never intended that those words, separation of church and state, would expel prayer out of school and Bible reading. And you can't even have a Bible in a school library because that's not separation of church and state. He never intended that, that we'd re remove all the 10 commandments you know, for, or crosses or nativities from public spaces. Um, you know, you, you, Christians can't even say anything. If you're a, a, a government member or, or you know, whatever, a, a staff of, of some public service, you, you better not have any sign of Christianity, you know, or else you're, you're violating separation of church and state. But that's just all um, hogwash. Um, we are actually protected as Christians. We should be able to uh, express our faith but that's, that's been challenged for so long now. It was clear that Jefferson didn't uh, take that. By the way, how do I know that? Some of you might be saying, well, how do you know? Were you there? Well, read the Danbury Baptist letter, first of all, and you don't even have to be that smart to figure out what he meant. But even more so, watch what Thomas Jefferson did in history. After he wrote the letter to Danbury Baptist, after the whole thing was put into, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, First Amendment was put in and in, in, in signed in, as the president of the United States, he did stuff that made it clear that he did not mean what people make it to mean today. For example, just one example, I'll give you a bunch. But one example is Jefferson used as the president of the United States federal money to teach Indians the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and he wrote, you, you, there's actually also in the National Archives, you can read some of his letters and his signed legislation that approved funding for this. Uh, annual support for the, the, the tribes. I guess the Roman Catholic Church was trying to minister to the, um, the, the Native American tribes. And, uh, and he signed in money from the government to pay for Bibles and for a church to be built. In fact, here's, here's one in Henry S. Randall, Life of Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, 1858 uh, sort of uh, biography, um, says this, this was what the policy was. He says, and whereas the greater part of the tribes having been baptized and received into the Catholic church to which they are much attached, the United States will give annually for seven years, $100, toward the support of a priest of that religion and $300 to assist in the building and the erection of the church. You say, Brett, $100 or $300, man, that's like not even a tank of gas anymore right now. <laughs> well, you gotta remember, this is like a, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Uh, and you could build a church for $300 back then. Uh, and so, um, so this is just, um, not just Jefferson giving money to um, help the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But not just Jefferson, Washington did the same thing. Um, recommended that government funds be used to support various ministries uh, around the United States, um, indicating the founding fathers recognized no separation of church and state as it's being sort of propagated today and, and trying, they're trying to make it sound like it's, it's a real thing. And they've been successful. Um, a few years back at Westland, there was a student that um, was being hammered away. A couple students came and said, Pastor Brett, would you come speak at our class? And um, uh, you know, our teachers you know, just ha hammering away on this separation of church and state. And they said, if, you, if your pastor will come and talk, I'll let him speak. So I went and spoke up at Westland in a class. And, I, and, and um, the teacher was kind of just back, I think just sort of fuming in the back of their desk as I was telling the students, to, um, where do we find the word separation of church and state? And, uh, and see, that's the little thing that nobody wants you to know, that they just don't exist in any of our laws or legislation. It's just a figment of people's imagination. And uh, it was kind of fun being able to go in there into hostile territory there. Um, but, uh, but what's interesting is you and I have had to live with this separation of church and state being crammed down our throats as Christians for the last hundred years until a couple weeks ago. Um, this is interesting. The Supreme Court of the United States is starting to make some interesting decisions um, that as Christians, we're all kind of like, is this really happening? Because it's been so long since we've seen something good come out of the United States. Actually, the United States moving in the right direction. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's freaking everybody out. Like, people are angry. Like this Guardian article, uh, this came out yesterday. Um, oh, whoops, I'm behind. Um, the Guardian ar article um, uh, says this, alarm as the U.S. Supreme Court takes a hatchet to church and state separation. That's the title of this article, um, which I'm saying, praise the Lord, you know, took a hatchet to it, yay. Uh, uh, they need to ax it. Um, but this article says, the court, this is a hostile article, keep in mind. The court said to be pro, more pro-religion than the, since the time of the 1950s, wrapped up one of its most consequential and divisive terms this week. Critics lamented a string of decisions that they say undermine legal traditions that prevent government officials from promoting any particular faith. Last month, they endorsed taxpayer money paying for students to attend religious schools under Maine tuition assistance program in rural areas uh, lacking nearby public high schools. This, this by the way, um, is opening the door to something that I, ever since I was, a, you know, I graduated with an, a degree in education as a teacher, and I've always had a heart for this. I'd love to see, um, you know, our nation get to where we have more of a voucher system. You know, because basically, you know, all of your tax dollars, you are paying for transgender education for elementary kids. That's what your money is paying for. This public school education um, uh, is totally whacked. Now, let me just say something sideline of this. We have some teachers that are still in public school that are working super hard and doing an amazing good job. My daughter is one of them. My daughter, Casey, is an amazing teacher. Like, she kills it. She works harder than anybody I know. Um, and she's in a hostile territory of public schools. She's not a member of the Teachers Association, which is unusual. And a bunch of her friend teachers are going, you don't have to be a member of that? And you know, Casey's like, of course not. And so they're all kind of bailing out of that. And it's kind of cool to see uh, Casey's got an in influence on, on, on the public school. And I think it's radical. She's in the front, front lines, trenches. Uh, we gotta be praying for those teachers. But at the same time, I gotta say, anybody in their right mind wouldn't send their kids to public school anymore. I, I, I sent my kids uh, to public school because I wanted them to be salt and light and be, you know, and they did. And that was, but it was, it was touch and go back when my kids were in elementary and middle school and, and high school. But today the agenda is so crazy and the level, like I, I can't even imagine, um, you know, why, why somebody would do, send their kids to the public school. It's just so perverted and so tweaked out. Um, I just wanna challenge you on that, mom and dad. Pray about that, because there's a lot of kids coming out totally changed, and parents are scratching their heads. Why are my kids coming out, you know, Satanist? <laughs> or, or anti-God, or anti-church, or, you know, leaving their faith and all that. Uh, schools are pushing really, really hard. But be that as it may, this, this decision by the Supreme Court opens the door for more of a voucher system where, Basically, um, the way that would work is families get a voucher worth your tax dollars and they can spend it wherever they want to whatever school they want. Um, a little competition would be wonderful because right now the public schools, they can do whatever they want and parents just say, well, it's our only option. 
can't afford private school, can't do homeschool, so they're just gonna get our money and we're gonna send our kids to public school. But can you imagine, like, like if, if uh, parents could say, this is where my money's going, and it'd be, talk about equality and stuff like that. You know, you, kids could go to whatever school the parents want them to go and they, that school gets their money. And so there'd be a healthy competition to do a really good job and teach things like math and reading uh, and stuff like that. Like, it'd be amazing. Can you imagine a school that taught math and reading and science? It'd be awesome. Um, and uh, I bet those schools would get all the vouchers uh, and all the other uh, woke schools would be uh, lonely, which would be wonderful. Um, be that as I may, that Supreme Court decision from the main uh, tuition assistance program issue sort of opened that door for the first time, kind of interesting. Um, then another one, they backed the American football coach in Washington State, um, public high school coach. Wasn't that great? The Supreme Court. Um, this guy, you know, uh, this article, the way this article listened to this, uh, they backed the American football coach who was suspended by a local school district for refusing to stop leading Christian prayers with prayers on the field after games. Uh, the way they're making this sound, like he was like, you know, he, he would go out there oftentimes and just pray by himself uh, on the field, you know, after a game. Uh, and, and then eventually some, some Christian uh, football players wanted to join him in prayer. Um, but the Supreme Court, for the first time, we've actually seen the right direction on this. They ruled that this guy has the liberty, the First Amendment protects him. He can pray wherever he wants to. Yeah, but he's a state employee and he can't pray anymore. Um, separation of church and state. This is where the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's not a thing. And it's driving people nuts today. Um, in all these cases, it says, this article says, the court decided against government officials whose policies and actions were taken to avoid violating the Constitution's First Amendment, prohibition on government endorsement, um, religion known as the Establishment Clause. Um, this is them arguing for their dumb little separation of church and state they've been pushing for a long, long time. Um, could it be that we're changing direction on that? I don't know, it, it looks that way. But, but all that to say, you wanna know one of the biggest things that has thwarted the United States in their, their, their pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? I believe this idea of our government, you know, you can't pray anymore, you can't have God, you don't talk about the Lord or anything like that, you remove religion altogether. Um, you know, no wonder we're not having good life. No wonder our liberties are being taken away from us, and no wonder people are not as happy as they used to be. We're failing in the, 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 the endeavors of the Declaration of Independence. We, for, for a long time, did better than any other country. There's a reason why people, even to this day, try to flood into our nation. Um, we're still sort of going on momentum, in my opinion, of what our founders did. Our founders did all the heavy lifting. And, and it's amazing how the Constitution got us so far and, and has done so well for us. And that's why people are flooding in and wanting to come to this country. But have you noticed? in your and my lifetime, and maybe even in the last 10 years particularly, we're, we're starting to see people say, eh, I don't know if the United States is the greatest option. Um, and, and we seem to be spiraling in the area of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I wanna say this, as a, as a Christian pastor who's a patriot, and I love this country, and I hope we can get back on a better course um, and maybe go back to some of our founding sort of principles and what have you, um, you have to understand the founders knew that, that for that to really happen, we needed, we needed to be under our creator. We needed to believe in our creator and live by our creator. The separation of church and state took the creator out of the discussion altogether. No wonder we're in trouble. So because of the abuse of separation of church and state as a nation, we've moved further and further away from the very power that offers life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that power is the Lord himself. We've removed the power of life, liberty, and the person have. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Uh, the first thing, you can jot these down if you want some great scriptures that remind us of where, for example, number one, life really comes from. Life uh, comes from Jesus himself. John 14, six, Jesus declared this. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's where real life comes from. Um, you know, John 10, 10. Um, Jesus made this declaration, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it, life, more abundantly. Not only does Jesus wanna give you life and eternal life in heaven, but Christ came to give you life and life more abundant. 
That's the pursuit of every American from the very founding fathers to say, we want life. Um, other nations offered death. And, and the United States became this bright beacon of light that said, we actually value life. And, and we want people to experience their fullest life. But in trying to you know, figure it out ourselves, we've ruined life. What we're seeing is all kinds of death. America has become a place of death, whether you talk about all the fentanyl deaths that nobody really wants to admit and talk, talk about in the drug abuse problem and, and what's going on in America, or the worst death that's happening, 63 million babies aborted uh, since the Roe versus Wade decision. You say, Brett, it was overturned, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Another Supreme Court decision that was amazing. But I'm also really concerned because Man, you know, we're seeing our nation totally divided on that issue, and the states that are pro-abortion are gonna go crazy with even crazier abortion rules, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're seeing some really ugliness starting to pop out, and you just hang on for the ride on that one. I, I think we've only begun to see that, but we've become more of a culture of death than life. Um, suicide rate uh, is high among young people. Why is that? Why is it higher than it's ever been? Um, it, we're, we're becoming a culture of death and it's because we've you know, excluded the author of life out of our lives. Um, it reminds me of a little parable that uh, a guy named Peter W. Law in a portrait of my father, he wrote a story that I thought was kind of, kind of funny. Um, he, he uses it as like a parable and he says, you're on a vacation and you're in your vacation Airbnb rental, you know, and you're there and you have a beautiful view of the ocean, the sand, the beach. And every day you go out and you go out and lay out in the sun and swim in the surf and then come back in. But there's also this little goldfish tank and it's sitting there on the counter and little gold, goldies floating around in there, swimming around. And you, you start feeling bad for little Goldie because you get to go out and have fun all day in the sun and get tan and swim in the ocean. And you kind of feel bad for little Goldie. So you, you, so you look at Goldie and say, what, tomorrow you're gonna have an amazing day. The next day you get up in the morning, you get your towel and your sunscreen and your, you know, your umbrella or whatever. And, you, and then you get a little washcloth and you scoop up Goldie out of the goldfish and fold it up in the, in the washcloth and put them in your pocket. And then you go out on the beach and you lay out your towel and you lay out the little washcloth and there's little Goldie flopping on the washcloth and, and there you are flopping on your towel and you're just taking in the rays. And you're saying, see, isn't this the life? It's awesome. And the little goldfish is just dying in the sun. You see, you say, but that's stupid. Um, that's exactly what we do. You and I were created to live in a certain way with a certain sort of environment and the world says, no, you can't have God, you can't have the Bible, you can't have prayer, and we can do it our way. And, and um, you know, you say, Brett, that's ridiculous and foolish, but you know, being on the sun uh, you know, is no environment for goldfish or any fish, they'll die, they'll not live. But for people to um, not have a relationship with God, the Father, and to know his son, people were never, never, never intended to live without that. In fact, to be apart from God is death. And the Bible says that the way of life is through Jesus Christ. Americans have tried to find life, but they're like fish out of water. True life comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. Life. Number two, liberty, as our Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776, they penned this saying, um, we want liberty, freedom. But it's an interesting thing how slippery freedom can be because our own freedoms can become bondage if we're not careful. Example, the alcoholic, oh, he's free. You could even say, Pastor Brett, don't talk about alcohol. We're free to drink if we want to. The Bible doesn't say, and I'd say, you're right, you have liberty. You, the Bible doesn't say you can't have a glass of wine with your dinner, great, good for you, liberty. But nobody ever just said, today I'm gonna to become an alcoholic. You see, your liberty, if, not, if you're not careful, can become bondage if you say, oh, we're gonna have a little more alcohol, just a little more, and pretty soon you're drinking some of the heavy duty stuff, and then pretty soon uh, you're drinking alone, and then pretty soon you, you wonder why you're getting a DUI, and you're wondering why you're getting fired from your job and your wife's leaving you, um, and you wonder what happened. You became in bondage to something that ruined your life, and you'll be the last one to know it. You'll wonder why is everybody so mean to me, and why is everybody treating me so bad? It's because you're in bondage to sin. 
That's the problem. And the Lord, he, he tells us in his word and he warns us about, don't be entangled back with those things that bind you up. We as liberty, freedom, Americans have used our liberty to become in bondage again. And that's what we're seeing today. And that's why people are unhappy. I love what the Bible says. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Today, the truth is hard to find in our culture. Definitely don't look at the mainstream media. Definitely don't look at, uh, I, I, there's almost no one you can listen to anymore and say, well, that's true. Um, you say, but I know a news agency, be careful. There's, there's so much untruth out there. It's, it's just kind of incredible. That's why I love, love, love teaching the Bible. Because when I teach the Bible, I know that what I'm talking about here in this book, it's withstood thousands of years of scrutiny and has been tried, true, and tested. Uh, I love the Bible for that. And, and the Bible says, you, you, know, you shall know the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Um, and, and Galatians 5.1 says it really best, I think, as, as it relates to the United States. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. A lot of Americans, whether they know it or not, are tangled up in bondage. The freest people I know in the world are people that are solid, on fire Christians who follow Jesus, who believe his word and do their best to follow his word. None of us are perfect. None of us are even close. We all sin, we all fall short. But for the person who's saying, no, Christ is the way and the truth and the life and it's our desire to follow him, those are the freest people you'll find on the planet right there. Christians. Um, so you got life, you got liberty, and then of course, number three on the list, the pursuit of happiness. Isn't it funny that even our, you know, Declaration of Independence only provides the pursuit of happiness. It, you, you'd think they would have said life, liberty, and happiness. But even these guys knew, they knew something to put the pursuit of happiness because as it turns out, not everybody's gonna be happy in the world. And even there's, the Bible even tells us that some people will be persecuted. The more godly you live, you might even find yourself in per persecution. So we have, uh, as Americans, the right to pursue happy, happiness. The problem is where do we look for that happiness? Um, and that's where we've dropped the ball. We look for happiness in a lot of things that actually have brought misery and despair. Um, this is where our text this morning comes in that I read from Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation. The word blessed there could be also happy. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord um, there in Psalm 33, 12. Also, I'm reminded in Psalm 19, verse eight, uh, the statutes of the Lord, which is like the word of God, um, are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Do you want rejoicing and enlightening? That's what the Bible does for us. And it comes from God. The pursuit of happiness is gonna be found best by seeking after the Lord. And just, just remember, you know, Jesus on, uh, on his um, Sermon on the Mount, he gave the, the Beatitudes, the attitudes which we are to be. Um, and it's great because remember how over and over he said, blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be blessed, blessed, blessed. The word blessed there is the King Jimmy way of saying happy, happy, happy. Happy are the people who follow after the Lord. And that's what the Bible tells us and promises us. And that, the funny thing about being a Christian, even if you have a tough life and you're dealing with difficult things, it's amazing how people can even be happy even in the midst of their struggle when you're a person who follows Christ. Um, I was standing in the back uh, last week um, during one of the services while worship was going and just kind of singing along. And it's fun to see some of you guys between services and stuff and talk with y'all. But um, Naomi and Anderson and I were just there by the coffee talking and this, this really sweet lady comes up and she's got a walker and she's, you know, you can tell like she's wearing like the, you know, the, the thing that sometimes like maybe a cancer person would be wearing on her head. And, uh, and she just, with a joyful heart, she just came in, oh, it's good to see you, Pastor Brett, and said hi, and, and, um, and we talked for a second, and said, yeah, I've got cancer, and she, she mentioned how she just has a short time to live. And Naomi and I just kind of looked at each other like, this lady is just so amazing, and she was just so joyful and bubbly, and she was so happy to be at church. And we just kind of were moved and we were able to pray with her and, and um, talk with her there. It was just kind of a neat, neat thing to see uh, a Christian she knows where she's going. 
She knows where she's headed. You know, um, as a Christian, the day we die is the best day of our life when we get to go to heaven and be with the Lord. And I, and I got a sense that she just had that joy. I'm sure people that don't know the Lord are thinking, what's wrong with her? Why should, she should be upset. She should be angry, but not so. The pursuit of happiness is found, no matter how tough your times are, in, in the Lord himself. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. You know, um, do the United States, now some of you are still kind of going, yeah, but I kind of like the separation of church and state. And the reason why is because what if the Muslims try to do it, you know, tell us what to do and try to influence? Well, one thing you got to know is the founders, they were not Muslims. Oh, Brett, Thomas Jefferson was a Muslim. Did anybody, some of you maybe were taught that, by the way, in public school. And you want to know why your goofball teacher said that? It's because Thomas Jefferson owned a Koran. By the way, I own, I own a Koran. I've read it several times. Does that make me a Muslim? Thomas Jefferson's uh, Koran was marked up, underlined, highlighted, and, and it's so funny because the, these uh, you know pipe puffing, cardigan wearing professors you know are saying you know look Thomas Jefferson was really a Muslim, um, and and it's because of his marked up Koran that was in his library. Do you want to know if you just take a half a second? and kind of understand Thomas Jefferson. Does anybody know why was Thomas Jefferson so curious about the Quran? Does anybody know? The Barbary Pirates. The United States had a massive naval war during Thomas Jefferson's presidency, and he had to do battle against the Muhajirin. Did they say that wrong? Yeah. Uh, those guys, you know, the, the Muslim pirates that were, that were, you know, stopping all of American trade uh, across the, the ocean. And they were, you know, it was, it was hurting us as a nation. It was, it was the thing that made us build a really powerful navy uh, and it got things going so we could thump on the Muslims that were marauding and, and pirating our ships. And Thomas Jefferson wanted to get into the mind of these people and how they worked. Um, there's all kinds of documentation on that. They just won't tell you that part uh, in your schools because they have an agenda. But what, what was it? What, was it? Was it Islam? Was it Buddhism? Was that the founders? Were they all so open-minded to all these other religions? No, uh, not even close. Listen to what George Washington said in his farewell address as the president of the United States. He said, do not let anyone claim the tribute of American patriotism if they ever attempt to remove religion from politics. Well, Brett, what, what religion are we talking about? Islam? Well, that's not, what Tom, that's not what George Washington wanted. George Washington was a Christian and he even made statements about how we need to have Jesus Christ be at the center of our nation. I should have brought those quotes too. I've got hundreds of these quotes, by the way. But this is one of my favorite ones because can you imagine the House Judiciary Committee um, dealing with this, the separation of church and state? This, this was one of the biggest dealings with the separation of church and state very early. There was the agenda that I already mentioned where people were saying there should be a wall of separation and there's no place for religion in politics and all that. And Christianity should be shunned. That was the, the thing. So the House Judiciary Committee did a report March 27th, 1854. This is the cowboy days um, when, when the House Judiciary in Washington, D.C. met. Um, and they were trying to deal with a suit to force separation of church and state more on the nation at that time. And this was, the, this was um, a little bit of, I'm gonna read you just a paragraph of their report. It was a long report, but this is from 1854. Listen to this. They said, had the people during the American Revolution had any suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the amendments, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, not any one sect, in this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the Republic and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. The great and vital conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and the divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you imagine Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer <laughs> like saying in a House Judiciary Committee saying something like this, we, we believe America is a Christian nation and, and we're founded on truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was way back in 18, you know, 54. Um, but the, you know, atheist people that didn't want God in government, they hammered away since 1854 and they've had their way pretty much ever since. 
up until just a few weeks ago, which I'm so thankful for. We're seeing some, some and, and by the way, people are going nuts because of what's happened in the Supreme Court. It's just going crazy. Um, you know, another one, and I'll end with this one. Uh, I'd like to get you out early today. Uh, but um, French writer, uh, this is one of my favorites. I've mentioned this before. French writer, Alexis de Tocqueville. And the reason I like it is normally the French are a little wacko. But um, <laughs> sorry if you're French. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but... Uh, oftentimes I don't agree with their worldview, but interesting, French writer Alexis de Tocqueville um, came to the United States of America in 1831, and the reason he was kind of on a mission to find out what was the greatness of this nation, uh, what made the United States great. And so he wrote about it, and this is what he said. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. He said, I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, in her ample rivers, her fertile fields, and boundless forests, but it was not there. I sought for it in her rich minds, her vast world commerce, her public school system, in her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. I looked for the greatness of America in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, but it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. How prophetic was that? Like this guy nailed it. And sadly, that's why we're seeing the decline, it seems, of America. And as a patriot, that makes me really sad. I would love to see America's pulpits once again flame with righteousness as he saw back in those days, where pastors teach the Bible, not wokeism where pastors teach the gospel of Jesus Christ rather than how to balance your checkbook. Like I, I really believe that, that, that we have to own it a little bit as Christians for mousing in the corner when the world has tried to cram their agenda down our throats and we just kinda, oh, I don't wanna, we're just gonna talk about what we're for. We're not gonna talk about what we're against. We're gonna, we don't wanna make waves. We don't wanna be, you know, Jesus was all about love. You know, it's interesting, Jesus was the embodiment of love it's interesting to me because people forget some of the things Jesus said. I, I um, you know, always keep these conversations like about abortion. I did a Instagram truck talk about the Roe versus Wade decisions and thoughts on that. And get some pretty fiery people saying, you know, you, what right do you have? This is disgusting. You, you know, and it goes on and there's some pretty uh, angry things. And I, I like some of the things some of you have said. And I, I always love it when there's very respectful and loving Christians. But I also think we need to declare the truth and speak the truth. You know, um, when someone says, your position on abortion is disgusting, and I say, well, actually, um, taking a baby that's supposed to be in the safest place in the world for a baby in the mother's womb and burning its body with a saline solution and then hacking it into pieces and pulling it out, uh, sometimes still half alive, that's disgusting. Well, Brett, Jesus wouldn't have said something so bad. No, he said something worse. If you offend one of these little children, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean. That's what Jesus said. Jesus is love. <laughs> no, Jesus said what he was against. Um, don't, don't forget that. We as Christians have become mamby-pamby people afraid to just speak truthful things. And I think we need to be bold in love. Jesus had that perfect balance of love and grace, but he also spoke the truth. And that's what we need today. You know, as a, as a person who loves this country, I'm gonna keep praying for revival in this land. I'm gonna be praying that, that people will come to Christ. And maybe with these Supreme Court decisions, there's a little bit of a reprieve where we as Christians can, man, speak the truth and, and maybe um, not be so afraid to stand up for what is true and what is right. Um, I love celebrating Fourth of July. We're gonna have fun tomorrow. I'm going to throw some meat on the grill. We went to the St. Paul Rodeo last night. I, after last night's service, I raced over, uh, had somebody drop me off because there's no parking over there. And, and then my daughter, Brooke, sang the national anthem last night at the, it was great. Yeah, it was really good. She's not going to be there tonight. So sorry, you guys missed it if you didn't. Um, <laughs> but she did a great job last night. And it was just so cool, you know, to, to uh, you know, I, I love celebrating 4th of July. But we have to remember, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Happy is the nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's where our source of hope really lies. Amen? Amen. 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 Lord, I pray on this 4th of July weekend that we would be a people that really realize <clears throat> the source of our true life and true liberty and the pursuit of happiness is really found, Lord. We know it's not in our 
in our pol- policies and our platforms. We know it's not in our politicians. Um, but Lord, we find only in you the answers. And I pray that as Christians that we would put our hope in you. I, I do thank you for allowing us to be a part of this nation. I pray that there'd be revival. I pray that churches would get back to your word and back to the truth, Lord, and be bold in in speaking your word, Lord. Bless these, your people, as we go our way on this Sunday morning. I pray that we'd be filled with your love and your goodness. Lord, I pray for those that are cynical or critical, even of what I shared this morning, that they would search their hearts, Lord, and search your word and see if what I'm saying is true or false. Lord, I pray that you'd give them clarity to see the truth. So Father, we thank you for what you're gonna do in our lives and in your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.